What's going down, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Commander Ad Populum. Commander for the people, by the people, for the people. This is episode number 28. My name is Ryan. Welcome. We've got a very special show lined up for you today. But before we get to it, big thank you to official sponsors of the show, FusionGamingOnline.com. You can go there for all of your gaming needs. And when you're done there, you can check out TheManaBase.com where you can find Commander Ad Populum alongside all of Fusion Gaming sponsored content. YouTube, written articles, podcasts, it's all there. You can check it all out. Second big thank you, all of the Patreon supporters on patreon.com slash cadpopcast. There's lots of great benefits there. We have become a little bit of a family. We've got a Discord, and of course, all of the patrons receive various benefits. So head on over to patreon.com slash cadpopcast. Very much helps me out, keeps the show coming to you. And of course, if you have anything to say about today's topic or previous topics, you can head on over to the Facebook page for Commander Ad Populum or at Cad Popcast on Twitter. There are always discussion threads for each episode. Today, we have an interview lined up with my good friend, Max Crandell, and we are going to get to that right now. Reaching for a distant star. Don't stop now. Isn't it strange to have a safe and home? Okay, we are back, and I'm here with my esteemed guest, very good friend of mine, Max Crandell from CMDR Central. Max, welcome. Please introduce yourself. Hey, Ryan, and everybody out there listening, I am Max Crandall. I am one of the hosts of another EDH podcast, CMDR Central. Uh, You can hear us twice a week on most podcasting platforms. Very excellent. So we had an idea to put together a show a couple weeks ago and just kind of the the calendar didn't really sync up <laughs> with my show and your show and with some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about today. So before we get to that, though, I asked my patron Discord uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, uh-oh, <laughs> a couple questions that they that they might have for you. And they all know you from CMDR Central. They they know you because we rag on you pretty good on on Commander Cookout. But uh, yes. We've got some questions. Let's see if you're able to answer any of them. Just rapid fire. Okay, let's do it. First question, your favorite altar that you own? That has to be my Space Odyssey lands done by you, Ryan. I was hoping you'd say that, but you you really didn't have to. Uh, you All my altars are done by you. Every one of them? All the ones that I currently run. Excellent. Okay, next question. How did you and when did you realize that you're a scumbag? Um, it would have been about four or five years ago playing in our local shop at the time. I made a deal with my co-host Chris from CMDR Central to take care of a problem in a game and I wouldn't turn around and kill him on my turn and I was the next player in order. We made the deal. I turned around and killed him. So officially became a scumbag like four and a half years ago. Well, excellent. Man after my own heart. <laughs> Boros got a win that night though, so I take it. The only win ever. Yes. Keeping on the scumbag track, <laughs> do you ever pull punches in games to not be a scumbag? Let's say if somebody's having a bad night around the table, or if somebody otherwise is playing a less strong deck or is a little bit less experienced than yourself. Um, yes, typically I will pull punches or maybe not play my most scumbaggery deck if I know I'm playing with new players. I mean, Rule Zero got, you know kind of into the wild this past year and that's been huge for all EDH players I think you know we saw it a lot in Vegas we see it a lot back here at home you know rule zero is kind of where I debate if I want to be a scumbag and then I kind of go from there but for new players I don't do that just because I want them to come back to my shop and play next week and the week after that and eventually work up to that point where I turn the tables and go and lock the game out or something. Very much so. Now, you mentioned Rule Zero a couple times and Vegas. We're going to get back to those really quick because those tie into my last show and what we're going to talk about in this show. But before we do, two more questions, and they they both relate to each other. Do you have any mustache maintenance tips, and how are you so good looking? Uh, Mustache tips? Just, you know, daily maintenance. Trim it up a little. Keep it clean. Don't want any weird, like, uh, creepy homeless man hair sticking out. Scaring all those little kids. Although it is Halloween time or was Halloween time. I don't know when this will be airing. How and how do I stay so handsome? I can't say that on the air because it's a secret and I don't want to have to 
murder a bunch of people, you know? Shh. It's all good. It's all good. I like that. You know what? I think I'm going to I think I'm going to have the the Commander Ad Populum quick hit question and answer session on any of the future interviews. So nice. That was actually fun in in all seriousness though, like the uh, the Discord community that we fostered is all familiar with you and your content and and they they did actually have some real interesting questions. And some of them do pertain to Rule Zero, like I had mentioned, I had talked about last week. And you sound like you're a big proponent of that. That's good. That means you're having the discussion on power level. It means that you're coming in with a plan on how you're going to play the game so everybody has a good experience. And you had mentioned Magic Fest Las Vegas, where CMDR Central put out like 50,000 shows in one week. Tell me about that and tell me about... As we move into our topic for the day, tell me how that kind of affected you over the next month of your magic content creation career. Yeah, so uh, for Magic Fest Vegas, we our show, we do one of our Patreon rewards is a decks you play episode. So uh, the, the Patreon supporter submits a deck list. We ask them a bunch of questions. We go over their deck live on the show. You know, do a tech a deck tech on it. Essentially, what you guys do over at CCO, and we just do it for a Patreon versus building a deck randomly. So, in or- we have a ton of these to do, and we are so thankful for all the support. And we figured, you know, Magic Fest Vegas, it's one of the biggest Magic Fests every year. So let's do something special and let's put a show out every day we're there. And a little backstory is um, myself and my co-host Dana Roach of CMDR Central and EDH Recast. That's kind of like our brocation. We take that entire week of MF Vegas off and we go and just relax for a week and play as many games of EDH as possible. So that would mean, so, so that would mean instead of the two shows you regularly do, you put out seven. We did five. We didn't do the weekends, but we did Monday through Friday. We had a show out every day. Okay, but at the Magic Fest weekend, let's call that even if it was just Saturday, Sunday, you were at the GP literally all day, like from rolling out of bed until rolling back into bed after you play magic at your apartment or hotel room or whatever you had booked, right? That is very true. And a lot of those late night games were with you, actually. You know, we I hung out with you guys a lot that week, which I am thankful for. And I got to spend a lot of time with you and the other CCO dude bros and the CAD pop people. It was a lot of fun. But yeah, it's sun up to sundown EDH every day, all day. Sounds like a a dream vacation, dream job, whatever you call it to <laughs> most people, right? And like, I mean, we can't, we would be lying if we said it isn't the best time of the year or one of them, but it does take a toll on you. I remember I came back from Vegas. We got in to, we landed in Edmonton like at 10 p.m. on Sunday night and we had a like an eight or nine hour layover and we didn't get to our hotel till almost one. We recorded a show. We didn't go to bed till three. We were up at five and we flew home and landed at like 10. And I was, I'm going to say hungover, but it was a combination of being hungover and having the flu because I just didn't sleep for five days. I was <laughs> out of commission for like a week. And it sounds like for you, you were out of commission for even longer. Some of that being Borderlands induced because that was just dropped like last month or whatever. But uh, tell me about that. Yeah, so uh, I went through what I like to call uh, MTG burnout. This happens probably once a year for me where I just get sick of Magic the Gathering. And I think this year it was Vegas is what put that nail in the coffin Uh all the prep going into that week, which was a lot of fun, and I'm glad we did it, and we're going to do it again next year uh, because it's our listeners enjoyed it, we enjoyed it, and we want our content out there. But prepping all that content weeks before and making sure it's all ready to go when we're there then getting to Vegas and just eating and breathing magic for a week straight. Coming home, it was the last thing I wanted to do. I didn't want to go to EDH night on Tuesday. I didn't. I did want to record our show. I, I still enjoy doing that, and I Loved doing it when we got back from Vegas, but it was one of those like, what can we talk about so we don't need to do a lot of prep on some of the shows? So we do our GP Vegas recap show and the mailbag shows, but Magic was probably one of the lowest things on my priority list for a very long time after Vegas, up until almost the last couple weeks, you know, middle of October, I finally hit, hey, I want to go play Magic on a Tuesday night and play a couple games, but yeah, you between Vegas and Borderlands, the video game dropping in September, 
that was really a nice palate cleanser is just having something to focus on uh, that I love almost as much as Magic, and that would have been Borderlands. So that, that helped a lot, and now I'm refreshed and ready to go, and EDH night is actually tomorrow, and I can't wait to go and jam four, three or four games tomorrow night. Yeah, you guys play on Tuesday just like, like I do. Yep. So you had done the Vegas thing. You did the extra content thing. I think over this particular summer, we can speak to a lot broader, farther reaching form of MTG burnout in addition to coming home after an, a, a magic fest. So I've got a couple things here that I'd like to just pick your brain about. How about consuming too much magic the gathering that could be that could be playing too much but i want to i want to stay away from that for just right now that could be maybe too many podcasts that feels weird that i'm telling people that they're listening to too much but it could be it could be too much magic the gathering stimuli that could be youtube that could be podcasting that could be whatever form of magic intake you're getting is it is it good to step outside of magic to get your fantasy fix or your gaming fix elsewhere i think it is i think you'd need a second hobby or a second not maybe not passion but something to fall back on when you do get burnt out on your primary thing, whether that's magic or video games or vice versa. Or or for somebody, I, I know that you are a giant hockey fan. You're a Ducks fan. Yes, I am. I'm a huge sports ball fan in some form or another. I like Major League Baseball. I like NFL and CFL. So that is some other place that we can gain entertainment value from, right? Very, very true. And like you said, hockey just started up too. So that's, that's great. It's another thing to keep on the back burner just to pay attention to when I don't want to pay attention to magic. But your comment about maybe consuming too much content, that's something that I didn't get burnt out on. I still looked forward to catching up on all my podcasts when I got back from Vegas on uh, Commander Ed Populum, CCO, EDH Recast, Magic Mics, all the shows that I listen to every week. I didn't listen to when I was in Vegas because it's like, oh, I'm with these people. Yeah, that's I right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wanna, I don't want list, to talk, listen to them on my phone. I'm going to hang out with them for five straight days. It's going to be a blast. Yeah, and you know what's you know what's the funniest or the best part about that is you listen in on all those shows and you hear everybody trash talk each other like, oh, if, oh for if sure. I didn't hear about that misplay with the Twilight's call on everybody's show for the following two weeks after Vegas, I didn't hear about it <laughs> one time, right? Have you have you listened to Commander Central from this week yet? <laughs> I haven't. It gotten, might have gotten brought up oh, again. Oh no, we're in. We're we're like in November. <laughs> hey, you can. I think it was Commander Social who brought it up, so it's on them, not oh, us. Oh yeah, no, that's 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 part of it, right? That's part of the package of being a trash talker and a scumbagger. I mean, that's part of it. If you can't take it, don't deal it. Exactly, and you know what? I I will take it all day, and I will play graveyard shenanigans through all of the graveyard hate. <laughs> And a lot of the time, you know what? I'll still come out on top. There's some trash talk for you right there. Well, I will remember that for next Vegas. Oh, yeah. I'll be doing graveyard stuff again, guaranteed. So let's let's keep going because MTG content, I sort of agree. Like a lot of the people that listen to any kind of podcast, it's part of their routine, right? They know that, for example, your show launches two days a week. My show launches a different day of the week. So it's like every drive to work in the morning or drive home, you've got your show that you are looking forward to listening to. So maybe maybe burnout in that regard doesn't really exist. What about spending too much time or money playing Magic the Gathering? Does this exist? Oh, that definitely exists in my book. Money, money exists for sure because very few people have unlimited funds very very few people the top one percent and and if you do please visit patreon.com slash cad popcast uh, and support ryan and go over to patreon.com slash cmdr central and support my show Ooh, good plugs good plugs 100 percent. if you're in the top one percent <laughs> get at me we'll we'll work something out yeah yeah m let's start with money i mean let's ignore the fact that going to magic fest and all these other tournaments that costs money that's separate but just buying the cards to build a new deck or what did we get eight new products in six months this year it felt oh, like yeah we're gonna get there trust me you know it i think it all comes down to like oh i really want all these cards from modern horizons before i go to vegas but oh i might get a really good deal at vegas at a vendor so i'm gonna hold off and then 
something changes in competitive magic and those cards you thought you'd get a good deal on now cost twice as much because someone broke modern with them. Yeah, that's right. I mean, yeah, you know, what's funny is last GP Vegas, like 2018 was the year that Dominaria was so hot and everybody wanted boxes and to draft and it was so great and there's so many legendary creatures. I got to MF Vegas this year. I still didn't have all the Dominaria cards I wanted. Really? Yeah. So I'm I'm collecting the whole set, and now that I've been to Vegas and back, and uh, me and my other scumbag friend Joel have kind of sort of linked up in how we collect sets. So we supplement each other when we buy new product, and we've that's that's a great way to do it. Maybe that's a, maybe, here. How about this? Singles or sealed product when you when a new set launches? What do you do? Primarily singles. You know, I look through the set find out the cards I know I want to try in my decks. You know, I'm a tinkerer. I don't really brew. So for a card to even get a tryout in any of my decks takes a lot for me to even want to go and buy it. So the card has to be really good for me to say, I'm going to go spend money on that at pre-order prices on the chance it's going to be really good in Brago King Eternal. And then some... Sometimes it works, sometimes I wasted the money. And that would mean that you buy very few cards when new sets launch. Yes. Okay. When you were going to, and I know you just said you're more of a tinkerer, it takes a, it's a pretty high threshold for you to build something new. When you do build something new, is it something that you get inspiration from? You, you're looking in your own trade binder or card box and you build a deck or do you find an idea online and then just buy 99 cards? What do you do? Well, I'm kind of going through this right now. I'm building Morophon humans. So the, you know, the Jelly Moose from Modern Horizons, the tribal commander. Yep. I've always wanted to build a humans EDH deck, but I didn't want to use a generic like General Tazri or some random five color legend. Then Morphon came out. It has some tribal synergies built in. It can reduce a lot of the casting costs of my cheap humans that I'll be playing. So I kind of started with that. And for me, you know, it's human theme. And I've also decided I want to make it pretty much an all permanent deck. I think I'm running eight non-land permanents in the entire deck, which is really out of my wheelhouse. I'm I'm usually a a non-permanent player. You know, I play a lot of blue, play a lot of white. So typically when I build, it's based on the colors I want to play. So this is my first five color deck and it's all kind of snowballing from there. Ooh, first five color deck. Welcome. The land base makes me cry every time I look at it. (laughs) Cry because you spent all your money or cry because you didn't spend all your money and it's terrible. Cry because I have to spend all my money. See, you don't have to. You don't have to. Maybe that's a future show building um, for, for you or me. Maybe that's a thing, right? Five color mana bases done cheap. I'm sure that that exists somewhere. All basics, all basics. There you go, all basics, and and then you're like playing to eleven or twelve fetch lands, and there you, you're okay. still crying. <laughs> you're still crying. You're, still, you're crying more than my norm, my land base right now because it's just shocks and checks. That's it. Oh. That's it. So, I, I guess what where I was going with that is if you if you have some idea of what you want to build and you look on the internet content, YouTube, EDH rec to see what other people have done in the past, does that lessen the effects of MTG burnout? Or I know for me to take a whole bunch of time to build a new deck, you know, in my office with cards spread out and doing research, that takes time that I just don't have. And if I wanted to do that, it would be, you know, 10, 11 p.m. at night or later and I just don't have the time. So for me to build a new deck, it's like, oh, I feel so burnt out on magic. Does that happen to you? Yeah, it it definitely does. When I do brew, I tend to lean towards let's start with EDH rec. You know, it's a great resource out there for all of us commander players. That's kind of where I start as EDH EDH rec. I'll go to Morphon. I'll click the humans tribe under the themes page and just kind of look at like the top cards or maybe the most synergistic cards. And kind of go, okay, well, that's obvious, that's obvious. And sometimes I look for the non-obvious stuff because everybody could run, you know, XYZ combo in a five-color deck. Well, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be everybody. I want to be unique. You know, one of the early, I like to put restrictions on myself sometimes. So one of the uh, original restrictions I had for this deck was all my humans have to be reduced by Morphon. Yeah, uh, so I like that. I like restrictions. I like being unique. Like that's that's sort of what Commander Cookout is all about, right? The thing about being unique, though, I mean, you can kind of get burned because you could be unique and find off the beaten path cards that are super cheap, or you could be like, 
oh, I want to play clones in green, then you got to like spend money on Willow Seder from Legends, right? So you, you got to find the balance, right? <laughs> right. You know, but I also then started looking through all the humans and I saw a bunch of cards that you don't see run in EDH because of whatever reason. So like I've always wanted to run Adriana, Captain of the Guard from the second conspiracy set that gives all your creatures melee. And I think she's five, three in Boros, but I really want to run her in that human deck. So I kind of got rid of the restriction of Morphon has to be able to reduce all my humans so they're free. And I went more with a, let's find cards that I don't play typically, or I would never really put in a Boros deck or a Simic deck or a monocolor deck. And let's play all those because they don't see play. There's a reason why they're only in X amount of decks on EDH rec. So let's bump that number up and see what they can do when you put them all together as a team. Yeah, and that might actually be another way to avoid the the MTG burnout is switching it up, doing something that you personally don't do. Even if it is something that is an established thing, like doing tokens or sapperlings in green or, or big creatures in green, but if that's not anything that you ever do, that is mixing it up, right? Oh, for sure. So very recommended. Go outside of your comfort zone, I guess, in in the Magic the Gathering universe. Okay, we talked about time a little bit. We talked about money a little bit. We're going we're gonna to shift focus on the time thing a little bit. How about all of the sets that were released throughout 2019? You had mentioned it earlier. Does that contribute to burnout or does that just contribute to us missing it or making us feel like we want to play catch up? I think it contributes to both. When I look back at all the sets that were released in 2019, I actually was kind of looking through my decks and out of all of them, Modern Horizons and War of the Spark were the two sets I put the least amount of cards into all my decks because it was, by the time War came out, I was still working through Ravnica Allegiances. And by Modern Horizons, I had just put a few cards into my decks from War of the Spark and all of a sudden Modern Horizons is here and then you know, the core set. And it just was a flood of products where I felt like I was drowning. I couldn't keep up. I was in that wave pool and the waves were just on the highest setting and I couldn't come up for air. (laughs) I like the analogy. Thank you. Okay. Since we're on the topic, what do you think about the 2019 schedule? So we brought up a list of, of products that were released in 2019. We've got Ravnica Allegiance, War of the Spark, Throne of Eldraine, Corset 2020, Modern Horizons, Commander 19. I'm going to throw Spellbook, Gideon Spellbook. What is it called? Uh, Yeah, uh, Spellbook, Gideon, Gideon Spellbook. That's how what I call it. Yeah, that, we're, I'm, we're going to throw that in there just because it was one of the ones that I think listeners might have actually forgotten about because it wasn't a set. It was just a small, well, kind of like a subset of promo cards. If we don't count that, that's six products in 12 months. It's actually a little bit less than 12 months just based on the month that they were released. Let's call it six in 12 months, which is one every two months, which is not terrible. But throughout the summer, we had between, I think, June until September, we had one every single month. Is that too much? I thought it was too much. I mean, from a content, I'm going to answer this in kind of two ways. From a content creator, it felt like way too much because it felt like every other week we were doing a set review or planning a set review. And uh, set reviews are fun, but they aren't fun at the same time, if that makes sense. You know, it's hard to do them. It's hard to do them different every time. Yeah. And it's hard to it's hard to do them different than you do them every time. And it's hard to do them different than everybody else does them every time. Right. I mean, everybody's going to say the same thing about the Great Henge. So why are we talking about it? Yeah. Did everybody say the same thing about Oko? Um, I think Oko was the... Uh, the underdog of the set review, but I don't want to go back and listen to them all. So you're asking the wrong guy. That card took off, I'm telling you that. Oh yeah. Glad I have one. I don't have one. I'm I, I'm missing like 20 cards from Throne of Eldraine and I don't have an Oko. Oh, <laughs> uh, I got in my collector's booster. I got the non-foil full art. Oh, that's sick. You know what I'm going to have to do? I'm just going to have to wait for two years for it to rotate like I did with... Um... <laughs> to Fairy Hero Dom. But as a Magic the Gathering player... That was still way too many sets, especially as an EDH player. Like, as an EDH player, you do have to look at every set that comes out, whether it's something small like Gideon's Spellbook, because you really want that art on that rest in peace, or something like Modern Horizons, because you get the talisman set uh, cycle completed. You get that new fetch land, Prismatic Vista. You get Ho Daddy. Yeah! 
And then all the way down to the standard stuff, you know, the 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 War of the Spark, uh, Throne of Eldraine, standard stuff. We've seen a power creep in that, which means, hey, it might not see play in standard, but this is probably designed for EDH. That's right. And so go pick up your copies. You know, you know what? Like a couple things to just expand on that a little bit. There was a, a common card, Thrill of Possibilities, that was Tormenting Voice, except at instant speed, and that was printed in Throne of Eldraine. And it's such a good card. Yeah, let's let's just say the word. It's strictly better than Tormenting Voice, and. Oh. I play Tormenting Voice in one of my CEDH decks, and I'm quabbling with, do I cut Tormenting Voice and replace it with, with Thrill of Possibility, or do I play them both? And in which case, like, what do I cut for Thrill? And this is the kind of thing that takes EDH players longer because we don't have tournament results pumping out from Arena and MTGO and various standard tournaments across the country and world, so it takes us longer. Oh, definitely. And, you know, making an assumption like that, it something is strictly better, X is strictly better than Y in EDH could be true for you and me. But when you go talk to uh, the next 10 people, they're like, no, that's that's a terrible decision. And here's why. And they'll they'll list 10 reasons why we made the wrong choice. Um, that's right. That's why I never and, say strictly. <laughs> <laughs> but that's also the great part about EDH. Everybody has an opinion and 99% of the time, everybody's opinion is valid. And for that same reason, it takes longer to fit these cards in. So when they pack so many sets into so few months, it's hard for us to really sink our teeth into any one of them. We might take a nibble at them and, and say, oh yeah, Thrill is better than, than Tormenting Voice and not really understand that we should play them both. We just think one is better, so we cut the the tormenting voice and we only end up playing one when really the correct answer is is like draw two in red. Yeah, I'm gonna play every version of that that I can, right? <laughs> I mean if that was a white card, it would be a no brainer. Your deck would be filled with ten of those before anything else. Oh yeah, definitely I would just cheat and I would run ten of them. <laughs> yep. I mean, I do that with Cyclonic Rift. Oh, yes. Every every card has a Cyclonic Rift behind it. Yeah, that's right. I'm just sleeving the backs of my cards with clear sleeves of Cyclonic Rifts pointing backwards. Yep. 100 Cyclonic Rifts. Okay, let's let's keep moving because we could we could joke about Cyclonic Rift all day. I was just going to say, does does the potential banning or, or overpowered cards like Cyclonic Rift lead to burnout? Maybe that's a question for the... <laughs> the uh, or a comment that one could leave on the, the Twitter feed for this episode. I don't know. There we go. In general, though, doing too much, spending too much, and having too much thrown at us leads to burnout, correct? Correct. What do we do then to alleviate this? Do we stop spending money? Does that mean that Wizards is going to produce less product? Can can enough people subscribe to that? Did enough people think that there were too many products released this summer to to make wizards listen to the give us more time argument? No, I, I don't think there is a, there, it's, there's no hope that everybody would jump on that. We've gotten too much product. Everybody just stopped buying because that cascades into way more, way more things than you think of off the top of your head. Cause like I go straight to, if everybody stops buying this product, whether it's a standard product or a straight to modern product, if those sales don't go well, we're not gonna get them again which means, hey, all that money they're flooding into Arena is going to go away. All that money they put into the MPL so we can watch Pro Magic goes away. You know, that might not be every EDH player's thing to do is watch Pro Magic, but that's a big thing for a lot of people is being able to watch the, the Mythic Championships and without people buying the product, there's no money to put those on. And that's a big thing for the game as well. It, it It's not like the... The, the $5 that we're spending on a booster pack or like the $1 in the United States that you're spending on a booster pack goes straight into the pockets of Hasbro or Wizards of the Coast executives. What a lot of that money does is is get turned around within the company and pumped back into Arena or like you said, the MPL or whatever, because those are advertising outlets for the company that they, from a business perspective, can use to run their company very efficiently. And in doing that, it's plastered all over YouTube, all over Facebook and social media feeds. So everybody sees it, it grows the game. It's it's cyclical at that point because new people are coming in and spending money on these products because to them, Throne of Eldraine is the first thing they've ever seen or Modern Horizons was the first thing they ever saw. To us, it was like the 18th thing we saw this year. <laughs> or this week, depending on the week. Yeah, that's right. 
I mean, we, we joke about it, but really, it's it's essentially the, the functional equivalent of killing us with kindness, right? Oh, for sure. I mean, if if we weren't buying this stuff, they wouldn't keep making it. But the fact that they keep me making it, they know we're going to buy it. The collective we, it's... you mean. The collective we. Yes, the collective we. I didn't buy some of this stuff because there was just too much of it. And And same here, but like... It's a cycle. It's in order to keep the game going, new sets have to come out and new sets equal money. So why don't we print more sets? Yep. Like that that's the cycle and you know, they can break the cycle in one way by saying, "Hey, we're going to skip standard and go right to modern." You know, with Modern Horizons, you know, I'm sure there's another battle bond coming right around the corner and that is directly aimed at us EDH players without saying EDH battle bond. Yeah, that's right. There was a big announcement today. I like to stay away from contemporary announcements other than sets as much as I can, but there was an announcement today that there are some new, very big products coming out. So it's exciting. And again, like you can't complain about killing anybody with kindness. No, no, not at all. I'll, I'll take new sets because that means they want us to keep playing. Okay, that sounds like a really good place to end on, lest we double the length of the show and I cut it into two like I've done in previous interviews. But trust me, Max, I will have you on again whenever you just say the word. Let everybody else know where to find you. Well, awesome, Ryan. Thank you again for having me on Commander Ed Populum. I've been looking forward to this and can't wait to be on again. And for those who want to reach me, you can find me on Twitter at CMDRCentral underscore Max. And of course, check me out twice a week on CMDR Central. Okay, everybody, I'll see you in just a sec. And there we have it, folks. That's the interview with Max. I hope everybody found it as fun, entertaining, enlightening as I did. Max is a really good friend of mine. I really like spending time with him, chatting with him, picking his brain. We dove right into it to keep the interview and and the whole episode on time today. So if you like the quick intro... If you like the interview style, if you would like me to have Max on again, let me know in the comments of the Twitter thread, the Facebook thread, or just get after me on any social media platform that you see. Very much appreciate it. That's at CADPopCast on Twitter, CADPopCast at gmail.com, or just by searching Commander Ad Populum on Facebook. Huge thank you to all the Patreon supporters. Couldn't do it without you guys. And big thank you to FusionGamingOnline.com for all of your gaming needs. I'll be back at it again next week. I've got a regular show lined up. We're going to conclude Urza's block in the set retrospective. I've got a a kind of little bit of a special topic for next week, just based on the time of year that it is. And of course, we'll have some technical section for the newer players to help them improve their gameplay, whatever that means, technical uh, game rules or, or what have you. So until then, everybody... This has been Commander Ad Populum, episode 28. I hope you enjoyed it. Please share it with your friends if you think they'd like it. Any any of the back episodes or any of the previous topics, just kick up a discussion and be part of the Commander community, whether that be in person at a local game store or online. It's always a ton of fun to talk about and be part of. And if you have any special topics you'd like me to cover, again, just hit me up on any of the social media channels. Be glad to pick your brain and chat with you. Until then, everybody, I'll see you next Wednesday.